The United States is undergoing a fundamental change in the way we view cannabis, and it's finally catching the attention of our legislators. 29 states have passed medical cannabis laws, and eight of those allow it recreationally. Each state has its own unique set of laws and culture, and my goal is to discover, learn, and share this with you, as I'm a true believer in the benefits of cannabis. My name is Zane Witzel, founder and CEO of Canador, and this is Growing Wild. Each episode, I will travel to a new city to learn about its cannabis culture and cultivation practices. I'm always eager to learn new things about cannabis, and I hope you are too. This is the real action. The pot party, the trippers, the grasshoppers, the hip ones, all gathered in secrecy and flying high as a kite. A lot's changed since the 60s and 70s. For one, we're not smoking that schwag weed anymore. Today, it's more tasteful, colorful, and potent. In fact, it's just downright delicious. But how did it get that way? Did genetics just suddenly take a leap forward? If you're like me, these questions tend to ruminate and I had to have answers. That's why for this very first episode, I decided to go to Portland, Oregon. It's well known for its craft cannabis and rich, vibrant culinary scene. It has this made in Portland ethos that energizes its economy. In the words of Alfred Adler, the only normal people are the ones you don't know very well. So maybe things will seem a little less weird once I get to know the people of Portland. This city of roses is tucked away in the Pacific Northwest and has something special you'll want to come back for. For me, it's pretty simple. That sweet, sweet sensimilla. With more dispensaries to choose from than McDonald's and Starbucks combined, it can be difficult to navigate this seemingly endless sea of retailers. One in particular stands out to me, and so I'm headed to arguably the best cannabis dispensary in town, Pharma on Hawthorne. Just got off the plane. Nice. Long flight, so I kind of need something to uh, knock the um, cloudiness off. Totally, totally. Uh, so Are you familiar with our color coding system, the way that we do things? I'd like an explanation again, if Great. that's possible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So. At Pharma, we definitely take a more scientific approach. So you won't see indica or sativa anywhere on any of our labels. And that's really because indica sativa describes more how your plant's gonna grow rather than how it's gonna make you feel. And so instead, what we do is we look at all of the chemical compounds found in each strain, so cannabinoids and terpenes. Terpenes being the essential oils found in all plants. They give plants their smell, they're in everything, but they also correlate to certain physiological effects. And they really influence the nuance of the experience that you're gonna get strain by strain. And so we look at all those things, THC, CBD, and the like, and then we divide them into this color coding system. So anything that's gonna be in red, it's gonna be more uplifting. Think a sativa-like experience. Mm -hmm. Anything in blue is going to be more of your relaxing varieties, think an indica-like experience. And then this white dot that's in this color gradient is really describing the degree of hybridization. So what I mean by that is if you have something like this koala where the white dot's going to be in that deepest, darkest red, it's really going to be 100% indicative of that experience okay. or that 
expression. So qual is gonna be super cerebral, really high energy. Whereas conversely, if you have the white dot in the deepest blue, like this Bubba Kush, you're gonna get into the more sedative territory, really relaxing. And then of course we do have some CBD intensive cultivars. Uh, are you familiar with CBD? I, ha I am, and okay. I absolutely love the experience. Yeah, it's great. I find it very relaxing and calming. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm able to focus, yeah. which is really important for me and what I'm doing. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's fantastic. It's medicinal potential. It's through the roof. And so we try to stock as many CBD cultivars as possible. Um, right now we have the Sour Tsunami and the Corazon, which are both pretty CBD intensive. The Corazon has a little bit of THC. Here it is from Yerba Buena. So it's indoor, uh, clean green certified cultivation. You see that CBD does have a kind of chunkier, greener mm -hmm. morphology to it because um, it is closer to that industrial hemp than THC dominant cultivars. The Corazon, I believe, is the highest testing CBD on record right now, which is pretty insane. Um, great for anxiety, pain relief, um, muscle tension, any type of immune disorder. The medicinal potentials are through the roof. We also call it here the EpiPen of cannabis. So it's good to have on hand in your medicine cabinet yes. in case you smoke too much THC, freaking out, smoke some CBD, it'll calm you down. Okay, it yeah. helps neutralize a lot of those anxious effects. Exactly, the elevated heart rate, the paranoia, the too heightened self-awareness. Okay. CBD will help okay. lower all that. All right, so we're sold on that too. Thank you so much. Yeah, Emma. it was so great to meet you, Zane. Nice Thanks you for too. coming in. I hope you have a great trip. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I got my bud. I have my safety card. So now I'm going to enjoy what Portland has to offer. When you combine science with cultivation, you get breakthroughs never before imagined. Put a few geeks in a room with farmers and you'll quickly learn how little you know about cannabis cultivation. Thank God for events like this, the Cultivation Classic. An event where breeders, brainiacs, and enthusiasts can share their knowledge and hopefully learn a thing or two for that next breakthrough. As for simple plebeians like me, I'm just here to learn all I can about things like terpenes and cannabinoids and what it all means in the broader picture. I'm meeting up with Mason Walker, CEO of East Fork Cultivars, a Southern Oregon farm that specializes in high CBD strains. Hey, yeah, nice to finally meet you. So, hey. I heard you, you were just at Pharma, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I, I really liked it. That was pretty interesting. Yeah, it's an amazing shop. You know, there's another shop I want you to check out. It's called Sarah. Really? Yeah, I think maybe we should go there tomorrow. I'm down. I'm pretty excited, man. This is like the big celebration for craft cannabis producers, processors, everyone in Oregon. This is sort of the culmination of all of our hard work. Uh, we've got a day packed with um, lots of learning sessions and panel talks, and then tonight we have a big contest uh, where we find out the best flower indoor, outdoor, and greenhouse grown in, in Oregon. It's pretty exciting. Well, let's check it out. All right, let's go. The vision of this event, and I think of Oregon as a whole, is that Oregon's about craft growing, it's about sustainability, um, and it's also about science. So we're trying to make science that, instead of driving massive production of single crops, that it celebrates diversity and it tracks down diversity and it helps little growers and it helps economic diversity and it helps Oregon be the sustainable craft-based industry that takes over this country that it should be. My background's in pharmaceutical sciences, but I've had a relationship with the cannabis plant for most of my adult life. Um, seeing the opportunity in 2013 with the regulation of dispensaries here in Oregon and the requirement that we had to do contaminant and potency testing to ensure the product was safe that was coming to market is one of the drivers for starting uh, and founding Cascadia Labs in 2013 in Bend, Oregon. We've grown and now have our headquarters here in Portland, Oregon, and we've expanded our line of services to not 
uh, only include the regulatory compliance testing, but a whole suite of uh, different types of uh, analytical tests to help producers and processors better understand and characterize their products. So for those who kind of took a walk down the uh, wall of data. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> What is that all about and what kind of body of work does that mean for your lab? Yeah, so that body of work included an extended terpenoid and extended cannabinoid profile, uh, analyzing 22 different terpenes or terpenoids, uh, one in the same essentially, um, compounds which are the flavor and fragrance compounds uh, in cannabis. And the profiles are different based on the strain and what we call the chemotype is that profile that is typically unique to the strain with both the profile of the terpenes and the cannabinoids. Um, and that flavor and fragrance is not all that the terpenes do. They do have physiological effects as well and can modulate the effect of the cannabinoids or have their own effect. So it's really this entourage effect, which you know Dr. Russo that is presenting here today at the Cultivation Classic um, uh, really brought forward. And now that we have these regulated cannabis markets, we can really start testing a lot of these different uh, active ingredients in the flower. And this is just a one of a kind event where we're actually able to do this for every entry at the Cultivation Classic and be able to present that data to both the entries for the event as well as the general public attending here today. And in your experience, have you seen any two strains that have the same chemotype, or is it different for every single one? Yes, there are a lot of similarities within the lineage of where that uh, original plant came from. There's certain terpenes that present potentially from, you know, Afghani regions were predominant, or other parts in Africa. Uh, where those original land race strains came from uh, was likely the origin of some specific terpene profiles. As we've begun to breed extensively and hybridize the plant here uh, through the the age of prohibition in the United States, we've really mixed up a lot of those terpene profiles, but you do definitely see some uh, uh, similarities between the same group of, uh, of varieties of different plants. I want to talk a little bit about the numbers and what they mean, because when I walk into a dispensary, for someone like me, I don't have a lot of experience or knowledge in all of these different chemotypes. Right. And my purchase decision may be influenced by how high a number is. If it's higher in THC than one right next to it, I may be more inclined to buy it. Right. And I'm wondering what your work has uh, done to help change or influence this type of thinking. Right. And that is a very common line of thinking for uh, folks in the current dispensary system to walk in, the consumer, and, you know, the bud tender will either, um, or, you know, the person working at the retail counter there, will a lot of times direct folks to the highest numbers or think that the consumer just wants the highest number. But most, you know, thinking uh, in the alcohol uh, paradigm, you don't walk into a liquor store and grab the white lightning because it has the highest percentage. You look for, you know, a good flavorful bourbon or a good rum or whatever you're in the mood for that day potentially. The same goes with cannabis. I don't like to relate cannabis and alcohol necessarily, but right. you know that's a good you know example there. And I think looking at, you know, not going in and finding the biggest highest bang for your buck or the biggest number is really the, the first step that we have to educate the, the general uh, consumer population as an industry that it really shouldn't use that number because the, the way that you dose the, the, the flour is how much you roll up into a joint or how much you put into a bowl and how much you actually consume is going to be variable anyways. So there's variabilities in how you consume the product and there's variabilities within the plant itself already. So those numbers between 18 and 22, they may seem quite different to most consumers, but from an analytical um, variability standpoint, the variability within those the plant itself, those numbers are quite similar, especially when you layer in that people are going to consume it in different you know, uh, draws or intensities. Right. So really looking at the numbers is the last thing that I would urge any consumer of cannabis, be it a veteran consumer or a new consumer to, to make their purchasing decisions on. You know, use y your senses. You understand kind of your intuition and how does it smell? How does it make you feel? The same way you're looking at fresh flowers to purchase at, at the market. Which ones smell the best, look the best, and really make that decision. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's the very first step. What we can use our data for is really going to be difficult to influence the consumer by this broad data set. But what we can use with our analytical testing is help our partners in the industry 
industry that producers and processors better understand and characterize their products and then eventually line that up with um, medical uh, healthcare data or other um, known scientific uh, outcomes with these different terpene profiles now that we can do more research and then those producers and processors can further brand their products and many folks will see um, on the market uh, new products that say this is for sleep or this is for anxiety so on and so forth and then the consumer doesn't have to look at a long list of numbers or intense data set they can the support is really to the industry yeah. that we want to provide where we want to bring intensive and sophisticated analytical testing to inform our partners that are producing these products so that they can better yeah. inform their consumer base So I came up here right at the end of 2014 and uh, totally coincidentally Measure 91 had just passed that made recreational cannabis legal in Oregon. Um, and really I was just sort of bailing out of the Bay Area. Um, Lee Henderson, my partner, had moved up here with his family and I'd been up to visit a couple of times. I, I really knew I wanted to come to Portland. And I came up here and I kind of started looking for a job and figuring stuff out, but this cannabis thing was it was kind of churning. People were super excited about having this legal status, building the industry. And Lee um, and an old friend of his had started this little basement grow in a house um, in Portland. And um, they kind of knew they were onto something. The, they were going to, you know, they were really committed to organic, super clean, high quality cannabis. They had this really kind of authentic, organic kind of music thing going on just from their backgrounds in organizing events and being in music production and being musicians. And they asked if I would come and see if I could kind of add the business piece to what they were doing. And we started, I joined them in January of 2015 and we started building Hi-Fi. <laughs> it's been crazy. <laughs> Good to see you Good again. to see you. How's it going? Good Thanks for going. coming. Yeah. All right, come on in. So yeah, you know, I mean, we, Richard and I built out our first grow operation for High Five Farms in a customized basement, you know, <laughs> coming out here. Having this is pretty crazy. Come a long way from the yeah, from the basement. Yeah, come a long way. I mean, we've had a ton of help. Don't be, uh, I don't mean it at all. Take any sort of credit for any of it, <laughs> but it is just you know it's it's been um, it's been a really interesting journey. So. Well, my official title is the uh, chief operations officer. Um, I basically do a little bit of everything. Uh, most of my day is running around juggling things to make sure everyone is doing what they're supposed to do. But, you know, I had a hand in from designing the facility to um, choosing which strains we grow, how things are marketed, and really just kind of grew out of a, it was a four-person operation, and um, each one of us in our roles has just kind of exploded. My role was operations, so there's a lot under that umbrella right now. Did you have experience in this prior to Hi-Fi Farms, or were you in operations in a different capacity, in a different role? I've uh, been a, a long-term cannabis enthusiast and um, studied horticulture um, in another life. And so I think having a passion for cannabis and studying horticulture, you just kind of naturally, over time, come to learn a lot about it. How do you know what strains to pick? There's a lot to choose from. Um, you know, strains are like, uh, it's like apple trees. 
know, they're all apples, but some people want Granny Smith, some people want Red Delicious. So I guess the first, the way it starts for us is that we're attracted to things we're interested in. Like every plant in this room is a strain that originally stuck out to us as something we were personally interested in. And then we have to put it through the gamut of what does the market want? And the market, a large part of the market wants high potent strains that uh, taste good. So we make sure we have some of those in the stable. And then we have plants like this. This is Medi Hayes. This has low THC and high CBD. It's not the traditional plant that people want, but more and more people are entering coming back to cannabis and looking for something like this. And there's not many alternatives out there for someone that doesn't want to get too intoxicated, but wants a more milder experience with also the benefits of CBD. So we grow this and we took a risk initially, and then it turns out that we couldn't grow enough of it. There is a response to it. So, you know, some of it is us taking a risk putting a product out there that we like and hoping other, other people do. And then we have um, strains that don't yield very well, but there's high demand like Girl Scout cookies and uh, strains like that. Those we have to wager, we have to balance how much do people want it versus how much are we willing to grow something that doesn't yield very well. The more finicky strains, they have to really be desired for them to get to stick around. Excellent. There's some very high CBD strains like ACDC that are just the floppiest, weakest plants ever. And we just had to press pause on strains like that because right now we're trying to pay the bills. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of CBD strains growing in here. We just had to pick the ones that were a little more hardy. experience cloning in a different fashion where you use um, synthetic nutrients um, to help enhance your root growth. Um, when I came to Hi-Fi I was inspired to find a way to do it organically using what we have in the wild around us and um, aloe oil and kelp is the most natural with the salicylic acid from the aloe, it just works really, really well and it brings natural health to the plant immediately. We're in a barn yep. right now. Here we are. On a former dairy farm, is that right? That's right. Just 30 minutes west of Portland. This is the hay barn uh, where the food for the cows was, was kept. This barn dates back to the 40s. This, I believe, was among, this was like some of the last work that people did it, uh, before everyone had, had to go off to war, in, you know, World War II. And then when they came back, I guess, you know, the world had, had changed. And so this, I, I mean, this, this is a pretty astounding place, in my opinion. I want to know the beginnings. Can you kind of walk me through uh, you know, how this all kind of shaped up. We, we bought this property in late 2015, um, and it had really everything we needed. It had the, it had water rights, which were incredibly important. Uh, it, was, it was zoned EFU land. Uh, it had this awesome barn. Uh, and it was just close enough to town that for those of us that live in Portland still were able to kind of make a daily commute. Um, it was, it was, the price was right, you know, and and it had these facilities uh, that we've been able to customize for, you know, for cannabis cultivation. You're doing events, you're doing rock shows, you're doing music we do, events. We do music events, we do, um, uh, we, we, we do events. Uh, I have a, a house with a very big living room in Southeast Portland uh, that sort of doubles as an event space. Um, and once a month we do a, um, 
once a month we do a performance at the house. Uh, we take all the furniture out, and so you know we've had performers such as Patterson Hood from the Drive By Truckers and uh, Steve Malcolmus who played in Pavement, and um, and we've had Justin Towns Earl, and we've had um, and we've we've started also moving into like more of like a, a comedy, poetry, music, variety show sort of okay. space, uh, and the events are really really fun, and it's an interesting sort of it's always a really interesting sort of salon of people, you know, it's like. People who work at City Hall, and then people who work in cannabis dispensaries, and then other musicians who you may or may not have heard about, you know, or, or have read about in Rolling Stone magazine, and then, you know, uh, and then my neighbors and parents from my kid's school, you know, yeah. and then the rest, all of our friends, you know, and um, and then the really cool thing is that we all the, you know, all the performers and the artists all agree to um, play the show for free, and we give we do charge. Uh, Ticket sales, and we give all the money to a different nonprofit every time. We just did an event last Friday that raised almost two thousand dollars for um, a affordable an affordable housing uh, nonprofit. And part of my thinking there is, you know, a lot of people are moving here to come into the cannabis uh, world, uh, and that is has the possibility, or it may be displacing other older or poorer people from their homes. Right. And I feel like it, we have a responsibility to try to offset that. So the overall reception from the Portland community and moreover your neighbors here on this property mm -hmm. has been welcoming. It's been accepting. Very. There hasn't been any pushback or you know no. not in my neighborhood type situation. No not at all. I mean you know we do I mean in, in terms of keeping a low profile in the neighborhood as it were you know we're very far off the street you know, we probably front to the naked eye. We just look like any other farm or any other big property. You know what I mean? We don't make a we don't make a big show of being a cannabis company. It's like we're trying to normalize this this thing here. We don't want to uh, be uh, audacious and, and flamboyant and, and try to put it in people's faces. We just want to be a normal business. So, in walking through the facility and meeting some of your staff, mm -hmm. it seems like you've got almost a compliance. You've got a compliance officer, and others participate right. and ask questions about what you can and can't do uh, with, with respect to the rules from the OLCC. Our license, yeah. yeah we, have a, we have literally have a compliance team. Okay. You know. And how has that been going as far as the regulations they're putting out? Are they in line with your business capabilities? I mean, we've, had, we've certainly had frustrations um, in growing this business. I would say we have. I have very little frustration with our regulatory body, our regulators. Really, um, we have. We have a very nice relationship both with the OLCC and with the Measure Ninety One Joint Committee, which over, which are the the you know the legislature, the legislative sort of subcommittee that oversees the implementation of adult use cannabis okay. in Oregon. Um, those people, they want to say yes to us. They are. They want this program to work in a way that I. I don't believe. Uh, is true of states like Colorado or Washington. Um, I think California is going to be a regulatory hellscape. You know, um, I think it's that's it's going to be a knife fight. Um, there's none of that here. The the you know the the people really. I mean, there's sure there is a there's a there's not even really like impassioned minority that hates cannabis. At least that we feel uh, where we are. I know uh, there are communities out on the coast and eastern Oregon that. Don't, don't they don't want anything they to do don't, with yes this. and you know i'm not going to speak to that you know what right. I mean? but as far as our regulators and as far as the legislature they are very you know market friendly business friendly they are open minded people they want this program to work they probably voted to pass adult use cannabis themselves you know mm -hmm. what i mean uh, which is so critically important you know and so we the problems that we have had have been way more sort of chicken and egg um, logistical problems that have arisen because of the way the rules were drafted you know there were regulatory catch-22s for instance if you you know there's a there's a there's a finite amount of people who are working on um, uh, uh, getting people licenses right so they, they they said all right first we're gonna license the cultivators and um, and the shops right they didn't license the labs which is the middle part at the same mm -hmm. time. You have a bunch of cult cultivators growing you know, cannabis uh, and a bunch of retailers uh, wanting to sell cannabis, but you don't have the lab in the middle. If there's a bottleneck there getting the labs their accreditation, 
then we're stuck, you know what I mean? Because right. we don't get the How can the customers get, get it? So, yeah. so you just have like okay. a catch-22 yeah. right there, or, you know, a chicken and egg sort of problem. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you know, and I think that is... But these problem, this problem was worked out quickly. It, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, I mean, these people, the, yeah, exactly. It was worked out as quickly as I, I feel like it could have been. I had so much fun at the Cultivation Classic, and I'm even more thrilled that you invited us to see your property. I really think you've got a great thing going here. You've got a great story, really great staff, and it seems like you guys are working very hard and diligently to make sure that you know all your ducks are lined up. Yeah. And uh, I'm really grateful that you could show us around today, so thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for your interest. I'm still in awe from my visit to Hi-Fi Farms, yet there's more to come. I'm meeting up with Mason Walker, who I met at the Cultivation Classic, to show me Sarah, a high-end cannabis dispensary with several locations in Portland. I'm getting this old-school pharmacy meets Godiva Chocolatier vibe. Pretty classy joint. So, this is Sarah. Let's check out the Lama Kush. Hmm. Wow. Cool. Here it is, Llama Kush. The Llama Kush? The Llama Kush, that's why, right. Why did you call it the Llama Kush? So Llama Kush is a strain that we bred at East Fork Cultivars. Um, we, two years ago, we purchased the Llama Ranch in Southern Oregon and converted it into a high CBD cannabis farm. And to sort of honor the history of the land, we, one of the first strains we bred that's very high CBD, low THC, we called Llama Kush. Uh, we still have a few living llamas on the on the farm. They're definitely a part of the family. So tell me about these numbers because I'm, we're looking at two different CBD strains here, and they both have completely different profiles. Um, to what degree can you actually influence them through cultivation? Absolutely. So as you know, we're just coming out of prohibition of cannabis, mm -hmm. and during the prohibition, federal prohibition of cannabis of the last hundred years. Uh, most cannabis was bred to be very high in THC, and CBD was sort of the forgotten cannabinoid. Mm. Uh, I, I liken it to prohibition of alcohol. When uh, bootleggers would make moonshine, they'd make the strongest alcohol possible because it was more efficient to sort of get those effects out the door. Mm. The same thing happened with cannabis. Uh, now with legalization in many states and um, you know, medical cannabis in 29 states, uh, we're st I think people are starting to rediscover CBD and its benefits. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the genetic pool of CBD-rich cannabis is very, very weak. So when you're talking about the numbers and the percentages of CBD and THC, we are working through our breeding program and through genetic selection to find and breed uh, CBD-rich strains of cannabis that are attractive, mm -hmm. uh, smell good, have really great uh, effects on your body and mind, uh, and also have those high numbers, which will get, will get larger as we continue to selectively breed for them. Yeah, there are many variables in cultivation of any plant, particularly outside. So you have wind, you have rain, you have the soil. We, we grow everything in native soil, which is sort of rare in the industry. And then of course the light. The light is one of the most important factors in, in developing cannabis cannabinoid content. So. Uh, different wavelengths of light can either develop more or less terpenes and more or less uh, percentage points of CBD and THC. So with us, we're sun-grown. We're using the, the sun and we have a little bit less influence on that pure volume numbers, but within the variables that we can control, soil health and trellising to protect the plants from large winds and rains, and uh, our integrated pest management system of carefully making sure that plants are healthy. The healthier the plant, the stronger it will be, and the, the happier it will be when it flowers and creates what we have in front of us here okay. and the compounds that we're looking for. What are you guys doing on your farm that differentiates you from others? Sure, so cannabis in large part um, has been grown, it's been grown inside and outside for a long time. Inside, it's often grown hydroponically, so without soil, with lots of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. When it's grown outdoor, still a lot of growers that grow outdoor 
cannabis grow in amend amended soil in pots outside. So they're basically taking the philosophy of indoor growing where you limit variables, you control everything, and they're just putting it outside for the efficiency of sunlight. We chose to take a different path. We grow all in the native soil of the Illinois Valley in Southern Oregon. So we, um, we actually till the soil like a traditional farmer would. We have uh, drip irrigation for our entire okay. farm. We have about an acre of planted cannabis on our nine acre llama ranch and a, it's very efficient water delivery system and we can put our own compost tea through that system. Okay. That does a number of things. That inoculates the soil with microorganisms that protect us against pests and it also delivers nutrients right where they're needed, right into the roots. Um, we're generating a lot of our own compost on site that we can then brew that compost tea with eventually will be a fully closed loop farm and completely regenerative, meaning we can um, get the soil to such a strong health and use cover crops in the off season um, to build up that soil a ton. So we don't really, eventually we won't need to bring in any outside amendments onto the property. They'll all be created on the property. That will help reduce costs as well, which will allow you greater flexibility to increase and expand or add new styles and varieties, et cetera. Right? Absolutely, yeah. It's a no-brainer from a business standpoint and from an environmental standpoint. Prevents ero so healthier soil prevents erosion. It uh, lowers our labor that goes into pest management and lowers the number of amendments that we need to purchase. Mm -hmm. and has a much smaller environmental footprint when you have everything sort of on site being developed there instead of all the transportation and outside um, work on creating amendments off site. Naturally, I had to try some of this llama kush for myself. Win in Rome, right? On to the next chapter, which may include more interesting things about cannabis. I trust you're still with me. After a quick tour of Phylos Bioscience, I'm hard pressed to find your typical Rastafarian burning down jays and singing one love. Quite the opposite. These are scientists, and they're changing the cannabis industry as we know it. They're studying genealogy to learn about just what exactly we're smoking. Blueberry is, is um, one of the few varieties where there's really no debate over who the breeder was. There's no arguments about it, really. Um, and, and actually, we have a bunch of samples of blueberry that, that DJ Short gave us. And so they should, those should be the real ones, right? And anything that's not right there, should, that's probably not blueberry. Um, except that DJ, even though he's an incredible breeder, is maybe not the most organized guy. And so he gave us a bunch of different samples of blueberry, and they're all kind of in different places. <laughs> but we don't know. They're all kind of in the same neighborhood, though. They're like a family. His other varieties are sort of in that neighborhood too, but they're kids. Um, so this is an example of a variety that's... On Friday when we saw the visualization tool in action, it was pretty incredible to know just how many of these uh, strains you've cataloged and categorized. And, you know, we're now starting to see the web develop. How big is this galaxy going to get? Is it absolutely endless and infinite? It's going to get really dense. We have a couple thousand samples now. Um, I don't think we're going to start to get sort of all the important coverage and all the linkages and all the connections. We have clonal varieties that are all the same, but seed varieties are all different. Like every seed is a unique individual. Um, and the rest of the act, they figured out how to make true breeding seeds, where all the seeds are the same. You plant a whole homogenous crop from seeds. You can't do that with cannabis. As a result, every time we get a variety from seed, it's like its own little dot in the galaxy. You know, the clonal varieties, at least, are in the same place, so we can collapse them into clusters. Once there are true breeding seeds, um, they'll all be in the same place, too. But the way it is now, they're filling up all the space. And that, like, that's just the data. Like, it's, uh, 
it's a messy, complicated population. And so the galaxy is always going to look kind of like this crazy explosion. Um, I, I think eventually it'll calm down a little bit, but having all that genetic diversity is actually really powerful and important. And this is available for anyone to see? Yeah, it's on the web. Anyone can go play with it. Anyone can see all the information. And then all the underlying DNA sequence information has actually been published as well. So all of that's freely available. So we sequence the first thousand varieties on our own dime because you, you can't uh, you can't sell a test where you're like, we're going to sequence the DNA of your plant and then tell you what you have if you don't have a huge database to, for it to refer to. Right. It would be meaningless. So we had to develop that database. Um, and then, you know, not that long ago, we started saying, okay, now we have a big enough database, we can tell you a lot of information if you send us a sample. And then we're like, okay, now we can charge people for sequencing instead of just collecting and paying for it. You know, it's not super organized, um, but we've, we've set up satellite DNA extraction labs all over, and we have people collecting interesting stuff for us and contacting herbaria that have these ancient collections and generally digging around for us. I mean, that's how we got most of our old interesting stuff, is from this sort of network of people who are really interested in the history of the campus. And so you have all the land races and you're able to understand when someone's combining something with something or the hybridization of a particular strain, you can still trace it back to something in Asia or Africa or... So the truth is we can't do that yet. Okay. We don't have all the land races. Um, and we don't have all the sort of evolutionary missing links. So. Let me put it this way. If I had 500 Thai samples and 200 Congolese samples and several hundred Nigerian samples and several hundred samples from Northern India, um, and then I got a polyhybrid sample from a dispensary today, I, I could say, here's how much Thai genetics you have and here's how much um, you know, African genetics you have. But I don't, I don't have that much coverage on the land races. Um, I just don't have enough samples. And so, um, so when you run the basic algorithms that break down your population into meaningful subpopulations, um, it doesn't break them down Asian, African, South American, or Nigerian, Thai, Colombian. Uh, it, it breaks them down into the groups that they naturally fall into given what samples I have. So like one of those clusters is like all the berry flavors. Okay. It's like all the raspberries and the blackberries and like we had to call that cluster the berry cluster because that was that's one discrete cluster. And then we have an entire cluster which is clearly like skunk. It's a skunk cluster. And that makes sense because we know that the genes from David Watson's original skunk plant in the 80s now exist throughout the population. I mean, it was like one of the main progenitors. But, so that's our cluster. And then there's a cluster that's all the CBD varieties. And we're going to need a lot more density until we can tell you exactly how you trace back geographically. But that is absolutely the goal. We're going to need a lot more samples until we get to that. But there's a whole evolutionary story to tell about how all the varieties moved around the world and came together in California and then in Holland and what they're all descended from. and. That timeline, that sort of migration history timeline, we just don't have that yet. We will. Um, I think we'll be at 5,000 samples before we start to tell that story. As my journey finally comes to a close, I gather with friends to throw a small shindig at a local wine bar. I sat down with event planning guru Samantha Montanero to talk about cannabis consumption and what laws are on the docket for Portland. So there's SB 307 that's happening right now, which is a social consumption bill for cannabis consumption here that um, initially we wanted to have um, lounges the full bit. We want, we want um, you know, equal rights to even say like a cigar lounge. 
um, within the, the Clean Air Act and um, you know other regulations that are currently in place that are posing issues for what we're trying to do. I mean, um, but it's looking like <laughs> it's looking like um, Oregon is hopefully going to have soon um, the legalization of open air spaces similar to tobacco consumption at bars. So you think about, um, you know, if you're a cigarette smoker and you're at a bar, you can go out to an area 10 feet from a door and to be able to consume. So we're looking to legalize at least um, the ability for a dispensary to have an open air consumption area right off of the space that you can purchase at. Something that is also really important to us would be um, special event permits. Uh, temporary event permits to be able to have festivals and gatherings similar to beer festivals and you know things like the dope cup or the cannabis cup or you know other other big um, gatherings. I just want to make a general toast. It's been a pleasure for me to be here this past week. I've gotten to know a lot of you and learned a lot about what's happening here in Portland. I've had just a great opportunity to meet businesses and, and share what we're doing as well with Canador. But I think the message is really being heard around the world that legalization is moving in the right direction, albeit slowly, but we're all moving together in the right direction. And I'm excited and proud to be a part of this movement. So I want to propose a toast to Portland and you guys for doing such a wonderful job in putting this all together. So to Portland.